Comfortable? I'll just check with our guest and see if she's all right. Ready to rock and roll? Good, good girl. She says she's ready to rock and roll. So that'll be good, so early on a Sunday morning uh, on this lovely day. Now for those of you who were here yesterday, uh, you will have heard our, our next speaker, and she was speaking yesterday afternoon at a quarter to three, Aisha Takani. And uh, I remarked then that I thought, uh, if I had any problems, if I thought I had problems uh, before I heard this young woman speak, uh, they disappeared very quickly because uh, compared with what this soul has put up with all her life, I have no problems at all. Uh, and I don't, I'm like, unlikely to have any in the future when I think about her. But my lasting memory of her presentation was that Aisha Takani is brave, she's confident, and she has a very personal relationship with God so personal and private that she continues to question him uh, about events in her life. She's a great lady for asking, after hearing her yesterday, talks to God and say, why are you doing this to me? Now, what is this all about? Now, that's the kind of relationship that I'd like to learn how to do. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Asia. Wow, what an amazing introduction. I don't know how to follow that. Um, how's everybody doing today? Great, it's so good to see you all here already. Um, and I learned something earlier today that I'm the cream of the creamiest cream. I'm the creamiest cream because I got here early. So if you get here early, you're creamy cream. And that's the best kind of cream there is. Um, but I just thought that I would continue with my story today because uh, I just wanted to thank everybody and um, for all of your encouragement after I shared yesterday. And I just thought that I'd share with you again and fill in some of the gaps. So, um, so yeah, uh, if there was a title for my talk today, it would be um, When Love Is Hard. When Love Is Hard. Um, so I shared yesterday that I was born with my heart on the outside of my body. This is my heart beating underneath my hand. It's on the outside of my chest. And I was born like that 38 years ago. That makes me 38. Oh my gosh, I'm 38. And I was born with my heart there and I was born with clubbed feet. My heart condition is known as ectopia cordis. And it's very, very rare. So I am the only person in New Zealand with this heart condition. And there are a few people throughout the world who have the same. And nowadays, if people are born with it, they can do so many things to, to relocate the heart and put it back inside the chest and all that. That wasn't possible when I was born. So I've lived for 38 years with my heart on the outside of my body. The other thing that I shared is that I used to wear a fiberglass shield that's strapped around my chest underneath my clothes. I don't do that now. So that was to protect my heart from being bumped. Because if I bump my heart or squash my heart, I could die. And the thing is, I've squashed my heart a couple of times, you see. So when I was learning to walk, I bumped my heart against my father's knee and turned blue. And my mum didn't know what to do, so she tipped me upside down and banged me on my back. And for some crazy reason, I started breathing again. Because my parents didn't know what to do with a kid like me, but they just made it up as they went along. And out of their love for me, I can, I'm standing here in front of you today. But sometimes that love was hard. I was in Green Lane Hospital for nine months before my parents could bring me home. And when they brought me home, anybody who came to our house, I would scream at them. Because I had learnt from a very early age that every time somebody came near me, they came to poke me or prod me or have a look at me or stare at me or hurt me. And so I thought that everybody that was coming to our house was coming to hurt me and I would scream at them. And my mum, she rang the Crippled Children's Society in Tauranga and said, this kid, I don't know what to do with her. 
and they said, oh, bring her over here. So I went over there to the Crippled Children's Society and screamed at all the children over there. And what they did was they put me in a soundproof room with a window to watch me through the window. And I had to learn that you can't scream at everybody, Aisha. Isn't that a blessing for you all today? But I learned not to scream at people. But in order to learn that lesson, I had to be put in a soundproof room by myself until I learned to calm myself down and stop screaming at people. My mom and my dad, they did hard things so that I would know that they love me. As I grew older, they sent me to school, and even though they knew I was being picked on at school, they made me get up and go to school the next day too. They didn't rescue me from being picked on. I had two older brothers who would threaten people on my behalf. So they'd say to me, sis, if anyone's picking on you, just tell us and we'll go down to school and we'll give them the bash. <laughs> but I had to learn that sometimes people treat you differently because you're different. That's hard for a kid. And I would come home from school and I'd cry at home because I never wanted to cry in front of people at school because I already felt like I was weak and I didn't want to show any more weakness so I would cry at home and my father would take me in his arms and say, Aisha, you are the most beautiful girl in the world and when you get to heaven, God is going to give you a perfect body. But on this side of heaven, you have a broken body and that's just how God wanted you to be. I try to imagine what it was like when God was creating me, you know, like when he was putting my body parts together and the angels were like, you know the heart's supposed to go inside, right? And he's like, nah, not this one. We'll just put our heart on the outside. It's all right. And they're like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. That's exactly how she's meant to be, with her heart on the outside of her body. Don't change it. That's exactly how I want her to be. And yes, she's going to go through trials and hard times, but she'll be all good. She can handle this one. I've made her so that she can handle these things. God loved me so much, he, he put me in this body. And yet that's hard. When love is hard, we don't understand how it's supposed to work out because we've got these preconceived ideas that love should always be good and nice and fluffy and bunnies and love hearts and all of that kind of stuff. But I know my saviour who hung on a cross just to prove just how much he loved me. And love was hard at that moment when he was hanging there. And in my life, love has been hard f for me sometimes. Love has looked hard and it's looked ugly. Love has looked unfair to me sometimes. And my mom, she wouldn't let me off the hook for anything, you know? So, like, she'd make me hang out the washing, wash the dishes, peel the potatoes, vacuum the floor, do all the housework, right? And people are like, what? I'm like, yeah, she didn't treat me any different because my heart was on the outside of my body. And when I had surgery on my legs and I had this big metal contraption on my leg, she'd make me put a seat by the sink. You can still wash the dishes, Aisha. There's nothing wrong with your arms. She was hard on me, my mum. And whenever I'd do something naughty, she'd still smack me. There was grace from her for me, but there was also discipline. God disciplines those he loves, and my parents disciplined me too. And you know what I had to do physio? I would say to her, mum, it's sore, and she'd say, I don't care. Get in that room and do your physio, because if you don't, your legs will seize up and you won't be able to walk. You'll end up in a wheelchair and I'm not looking after you for the rest of your life. Go in the room and do your physio. And I'd say to her, Mum, I hate you. And she'd say, too bad. Get in there. Get in the room. And my dad, he's like a softie, you see, and he'd be like, oh, but can't you see that she's crying? 
And my mom would be like, I don't care. My mom, I told you, hey, she's a dragon. <laughs> but her love had to be hard on me. Because I wouldn't be able to stand here in front of you today. I wouldn't be able to walk in fr- before you today. I wouldn't be able to do half the things that I do if it wasn't for the times when love got hard. Love gets hard sometimes. And the times that I didn't understand how much exactly God loved me and the times when he delivered me out of my hardship is where I learnt of his love for me at a whole different level. When I had an abscess in my brain and I was so afraid, sent everybody out of the room and I said to God, uh, what's going on? I said, God, I don't know what you're up to. I said, I'm not ready to come home because I've got this Eucharistic convention in 2018 and I'm going to Auckland to speak to this Catholic convention and I kind of need to be alive to do that. I'm not ready to come home, God. And I said to him, but if you want to take me home, you can take me home. All the time, my life has been surrendered to him. And when he chooses for it to be over, it'll be over, you see, because I have people asking me all the time, is your life span short because of your heart condition? I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm meant to have the life I'm meant to have. My heart only beats because he allows it. And when he chooses for my life to be over, it'll be over. I'm the kind of person I can walk out on the road, get hit by the bus. But you see, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So God knew about this day, the 8th of April 2018, that I'd be standing here declaring his goodness to you. God knew this day. He wrote it down. And he knows the last day of my life. I don't know when that is. And I'm kind of glad that I don't, you know. But you see, even when things are hard and when love is hard, God is love all the time. And his love for me is most evident in those difficult times. And when I was sitting there with a brain abscess telling him that I didn't want to die, he heard me and brought me back for such a time as this. And I don't understand, I don't have the answers to why God chooses to do the things he does. I don't need them because he's God and that's the end of that sentence. He is the great I am and I am simply his daughter and he knows exactly what he's doing even when I don't. When love is hard and it looks unfair and I don't understand what the flipping heck is going on. I have to just trust him. And God and his faithfulness to my life has been everything he promised he would be and more. And I am only too glad to be alive so that I can be his daughter telling his story all over the place. You know, I, I don't know what, what the future holds for me. When I got that brain abscess, they said to me, the doctors said to me, Aisha, has anybody told you about your heart condition? I said, uh, no. I just know it's in the wrong place. They said, yes, it is, but that's not all that's wrong with it. There's a hole in your heart. The good blood doesn't separate properly from the bad blood. And so when you get an infection or you get sick, it's easy for it to get into your bloodstream and that's how you got this abscess, the infection traveled to your brain. Because your heart and your lungs don't filter out infection very well. The valve that takes oxygen to your lungs is narrow, that's why your lips and your fingernails are purple because your oxygen levels are low. My, ox- my oxygen levels are about 78% 
and they put that little machine on your finger, you know, to test your oxygen levels, it always beeps when it's on my finger. And I watch the nurse panic, you know. <laughs> She's like, oh, maybe this machine is broken. I just go, I'm like, what number is it? <laughs> She's like, 78? I'm like, yep, that's right, write that down. She's like, oh, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, that's normal for me. That's all right. They said to me, as you get older, you will grow tired. Your heart will have to work harder. And that's exactly the case. My heart beats irregularly a lot. So I am on medication for that. So sometimes it'll speed up for no reason. Sometimes it'll go really, really slow for no reason. My heart and my lungs don't filter out infection very well, so I am always on antibiotics. Aisha, has anybody talked to you about having children? Nope. We would recommend that you don't, because it's a risk to your life and to theirs. And so all of a sudden, the doctors are trying to map out my future. And I say trying to, because God has already done it. God knows what they don't. And so, whose report will I believe? I'll believe God's over any other report. And there are so many reports. My hospital files are volumes. I've got volumes. Volume one, volume two. Just volumes all over the hospitals. And they pull out, you know, it gets added to all the time. But God has already written a story about my life. He's written the beginning, he's writing the middle, and he's written the end because he's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. And he fills all the space in the middle. Faithfulness. To me, all I have to do is look at him. And for as long as he's in the forefront of my walk and my life, I'm going to be all good. But you see, the doctors are still trying to figure out how this 38-year-old Māori woman is alive. And I tell them, it's because of God. It's only because of God. Currently at this moment, I have a tumour growing around my carotid artery. It's not growing very fast, and so they've chosen to leave it alone. But you see, so many times I've heard, we need to do something because you could die. I've heard that about three times ever in my life. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, did you hear what we just told you? And I'll say to them, yeah, I heard you. I heard you, but I've heard that before. Faithfulness and faith, just like we heard today, is being certain of what you hope for, and yet you do not see. Faith is the only thing, the only substance that I have to make sure that I keep getting up tomorrow, telling somebody about Jesus tomorrow. Faith is the only sure thing in my life at the moment. And I will trust him all the days of my life. I will trust him. And I hope that I will see you in the next 38 years coming back to tell you some more stories. So currently, I, I don't work for the Salvation Army anymore. I work part-time for a charitable trust. It's known as Live For More. My friend, she started it. She takes young men between the ages of 17 and 25 who are caught up in lifestyles of alcohol, drugs, and crime. She takes them surfing. I don't surf, obviously. She takes them surfing and she does group work and counseling with them. And I, I'm the office lady. <laughs> but I'm also a guest speaker on the program, so I get to meet the boys. I tell them my story. And they are always fascinated, you know. And they're like, whoa, you, you know. And then they're like, um, are we allowed to see it? 
So I'll show them, pull out my shirt and show them my heart. These big macho boys out there stealing cars and doing bad stuff. They turn into little five-year-olds when you show them a heart. And they're like, can we touch it? <laughs> that's so cute. But you see, the sister is right. People are hungry for God. And these boys, they're hungry to see somebody's heart on the outside of their body in more ways than one. Not in a physical sense. But you see, I can have those boys eating out of the palm of my hand when I show them my heart. Because that's what anybody is after. People want to see your heart on the outside of your body, on display for them. If we could all live like our hearts were on the outside of our body, the world would change. Jesus lived that way. He lived his, with his heart on the outside of his body all the time, every day. And if we could live like that, your neighbor would change. Your family would change. Your neighborhood, your community, your school, your workplace, everywhere you go would change. Because all of a sudden, if there's nothing to hide, then there's nothing to hide. The goodness of God is available to everyone. And yet we keep it like it's our secret little thing. And lucky you, you just joined a club. The church of God is not a club. The church of God is a force that is m gaining momentum in the earth. And it'll gain more momentum the moment that you look and see, notice somebody's heart on the outside of their body. I am physically born that way to share the message about how to be that way how to live that way, how to change the world that way. And I am so honored to have been here with you all today. And thank you for letting your hearts be on the outside of your bodies for me this weekend. I have felt so loved, so welcomed, and so embraced. And I'm so grateful to have met some of you. And I look forward to seeing you again sometime in the future. Thank you very much.